I know for some of you it was hard to decide because you had to look, decide between environment and biodiversity, uh, which are two things that I know may be dear to a lot of you. We have several presentations uh, to go, and the organizers have told me that I must make sure I manage the time well. And they have given me some little cards here to show. And I noticed the previous chair had to be leaning, trying to get people to, the presenters to observe the card to see the time. Now I know most of these presenters very well and there are times in their lives when they have ignored me very well, but today should not be one of those times, <laughs> right? So I'll be giving you timelines when it's 10 minutes, five minutes, one minute, etc., to ensure that we can manage the time because this is a very well-organized conference right? and they have a, there's a lot of things to do, so we want to make sure we're on time. So we're gonna get into it. You have 15 minutes and then we have time for questions because we have a very knowledgeable and involved audience. So we wanna make sure that we can get some questions uh, on the work you present. So without further ado, I'm gonna invite Zaria Oliphant to join us and she's going to give a presentation on benthic habitats in Jamaica. You, you want to... Yes. All right, she doesn't want to be hands-free. All right, over to you, Zara. Good morning, everyone. All right, as Dr. Robinson said, my name is Zara Oliphant, and today I'll be presenting on lentic habitats in Jamaica, productivity, and predator-prey interactions within the macroinvertebrate community. All right, so for introduction, freshwater ponds, these are lentic habitats, and they are important in biodiversity preservation, and when you compare them to other freshwater habitats, they also contain more species per unit area. Numerous studies have measured biomass productivity and uh, trophic interactions for macroinvertebrates in ponds, but such data are absent for Jamaica and the wider Caribbean. It is upon that basis that my thesis chose to focus on uh, these parameters for Jamaica estimating biomass from dry weight, measuring production based on change in biomass over time, and also assessing trophic structure by analyzing the gut contents of select invertebrates. What I want to leave with you is the fact that ponds are not insignificant features in our landscape. They're very important and they need to be preserved. All right, so this is a sample area which is located in St. Anne, Jamaica, close to the border of Trelawney, at approximately 900 meters above sea level. I sampled eight ponds, six were permanent, and two were temporary. This is a screenshot of the ponds, permanent ponds and temporary ponds. This one showing a few pictures of them in their dry out phase. All right, so the methods for the study Field method, sampling was carried out, first of all, from January to April, January 2014 to April 2015, monthly. I used, uh, my apologies, I used a kick net to collect samples from random sites within uh, each pond, 10 subsamples for larger ponds and for smaller ponds. And uh, physical chemical properties were also measured on site. In the lab, the samples were dried and the dry mass was determined as well as after the dry mass. Preserved specimens were dissected from certain taxa. And for the statistics, length mass regression was used. Length mass equations were derived from linear regression and the production was calculated using the size frequency method. 
Okay, so these are the results of the study. The benthic macroinvertebrate was characterized by specimens belonging to three phyla, seven classes, 14 orders, 43, fa 43 families, and at least 78 species. If we look at the pie chart here, the majority of, uh, just based on specimen count, Ephemeroptera, these are the mayflies, and Podocopoida, these are the ostracods, accounted for the highest percentage based on specimen count. Okay, all right, this is better. All, right, all ponds showed high diversity, more than 0 0.5, based on the Simpsons Diversity Index. And statistically, Pond 6 had a significantly higher diversity than all other ponds. And the physical chemical parameters clustered the ponds into three categories, 1 and 2 being large, 4 and 5 small, and the other ponds were classified in the mixed category. So, further results. Now, when the biomass was examined month to month, the mean biomass was constant throughout the entire sample area. So there was no significant difference from month to month. And this would imply a consistent supply of food for the macroinvertebrate community. In most months, if we examine the bar chart here, in most months, Aishnidae, that's the orange one, and the Physidae, which is in yellow, most months these two dominated. Aishnidae is a dragonfly and Physidae is a snail. Macroinvertebrate production, these are the results. Now, production measures the increase in biomass per unit area per time. Large and mixed ponds had uh, the highest sum production values as compared to small ponds. These are they, and for if we look at the table, the most productive orders were the dragonflies, the Anisoptera, and the ostracods, the Podocopoida. Statistical comparisons showed a very highly significant difference with mainly ostracods, Ephemeroptera, and dragonflies were more productive than other orders, and Diptera in particular was lower in productivity than these three. When we look at production by pond group, we see differences in uh, what group was dominant. So in the large ponds, which were wide and deep, the Aishnidae family, that's a dragonfly, these dominated production. The Physidae and the Stratiomyidae, which was a dipteran, in the small, shallow ponds, they accounted for the highest production by proportion. And in the mixed ponds, the ostracods and the dragonflies at the highest production values. It was also important to note that for all pond groups, the mayflies, that's the Betidae from the order Ephemeroptera, they were among the five most productive taxa. Now these are the functional feeding groups. Now just to state that one of the reasons for going into this study was as a result of a freshwater ecology lab with Dr. Hislop, we're in as students, when we collected samples from the ponds, most of what we collected belonged to the predator group. And according to this graph, which I drew, most of the taxa in the sample area are predators. 48.9% of all families in the pond area fed by predation. And 90% of the predators belong to the class insecta. So we have a few grazers, a few collectors, a few shredders, and predator taxa accounting for the greatest number. When we looked at count versus biomass, the pie charts on the right, no, on the left, uh, these pie charts here <laughs> show <laughs> the proportion by count, and these show the proportion by biomass. Now, if you can observe, the, in all cases, whatever family it is, whatever group it is that dominated count. So if we look at pond one, for example, collectors, and this is the number of specimens, they dominated in terms of count. But then when biomass was measured, the predator biomass always, in most cases, they were the dominant um, group as it relates to biomass. So that, that trend was clear throughout the entire sample area. Now, when we group, looking at the functional feeding groups, 
when we looked at production and biomass based on the pond grouping, this chart over here shows that, well, there was a difference in biomass among functional feeding groups, a significant difference only in the mixed ponds, where predator biomass was significantly higher than that of collectors. The trend overall, as we can see here, is that for large and mixed ponds, predator biomass accounted for a high proportion in comparison to small ponds. When we examined the production, production values were highest for predators in large ponds, highest for collectors in mixed ponds, while grazers and collectors were about equal in productivity in small ponds. So if we isolate just the mixed pond group here, we can see that in the mixed ponds, although predators accounted for a high proportion of biomass, it's actually the collectors that were the more productive group, the most productive group. How is the community sustained? Now, if we look at it as a whole, by count, based on proportions, collectors dominated. So the number of specimens, collectors were greater. While predators dominated the biomass. And as it relates to production, predators and collectors both accounted for a high proportion when it comes to the, the productivity. So in light of this, the question is asked, is the biomass of the non-predators sufficient to support that of the predators? If you have in a pond system most of these organisms being predators and accounting for a high biomass, and they have to sustain themselves somehow, how is it that they're able to sustain themselves if the, the orders, the groups from which they will be feeding are lower in biomass than themselves without these groups becoming extinct? So that brings us to the biomass turnover rates, PB ratios, production biomass ratios. PB ratios determine the biomass turnover rate, which is the rate at which an, able, an animal is able to replace its biomass. Higher ratios are associated with small multivolting taxa. Essentially, how fast can you reproduce? How fast can you add more biomass to your community? So that is what the PB ratio um, alludes to. From the graph, any likely prey of predators are able to turn over their biomass at much higher rates. This section shows the sum production and this shows the mean PB ratios. So these are predators and these are grazers. Now the reason that um, the, the pros here says collectors and shredders as likely prey is that if the predators are unlikely to feed on a snail grazer and so the collectors and shredders which they will be feeding on will be able to turn over their, their population biomass at a faster rate and thus they're able to compensate for any loss to predation. We also looked at the diet of the odonata, and it confirmed th that the odonata are predators, and that's on the basis that of the majority of their food type being animals. Betidae, ostracod, chironomidae were the three most frequently occurring animal prey, and uh, coincidentally, these three families also, when looked at by family specimen count, these three families were also the most abundant in the sample area. There was low predation on bay today by the damselfly and alagma as compared to the, dra the anax dragonfly, while both consumed caranomids in high numbers. So that can show some, some perhaps some preference. But the, the fact that the bay today, the ostracon, the caranomidae, which frequently occur in the sample area, were also frequently found, shows that these predators are opportunistic and feed on whatever is most readily available. Odonata diet, these are just a few pictures of some of the items that were found, a full hemipteran, copepod, etc. The diet of the ephemeroptera was also examined, and uh, we found that filamentous algae was the most commonly occurring food item in the diet of bay today, as well as, well, non-filamentous non algae and diatoms were also frequently consumed. Where there were animal um, where this, this bar shows animal, it doesn't mean that the bay today were feeding on animals directly. These were always fragments, like a piece of a wing scale, a cete, and that would indicate that as they feed, that these particles were collected because they would be existing in the system. By virtue of the type of algae found in the gut, most of these algae adhere to hard surfaces, and so it means that it will require some amount of scraping. So upon that basis, the bay today, which were 
initially recognized and initially said to be collectors, they were reclassified after the study to not feeding primarily by collecting, but by grazing instead. So in conclusion, the high altitude ponds that were sampled, they show high diversity. They also sh they're also taxonomically rich. Betidae, Ephemeroptera, and Cypridoidae had the greatest number of specimens. In terms of biomass, from month to month, it was mainly Hnidae and Physidae that were dominating biomass, while for productivity, Anisoptera, the dragonfly, had the highest production value and also accounted for a large proportion of the biomass in the large ponds. The functional feeding groups that were used in the study allowed us to also get an idea of how the functional organization of the macroinvertebrate community was. And it showed that the prey is able to adequately sustain itself in the face of predation because their biomass ratios are, their biomass turnover rates are higher than that of predators. Even with uh, the mayflies being reclassified to grazer status, the graph itself, if you recall what the graph looked like, the production of grazers and PB ratio was lower, but they would still be within that category, which would mean that as non-predators, they are turning over their biomass at a faster rate and still able to compensate for any losses due to predation. Dietary analyses confirmed interpredation in the Odonata, and it also led to the reclassification of the Betidae. So the other nates, uh, they feed on each other as well, because again, it's not that they're looking to say, oh, you're family, so I won't eat you. You're available, so I'm gonna eat you anyway. So at the end of the day, if we have a large water bug attacking a mayfly and saying, I'm gonna eat you tonight, the mayfly can boldly say, you can have my body, but you can't have my legacy. We will always multiply. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Zara. Not only did you do a good presentation, but you did it within the time. So we have a lot of time for questions. So are there any questions from the audience? I'm happy to come up and give you the mic. All right. The study is very interesting, you know, as a uh, scientific you. exercise, not really into my domain. But I was curious about your mathematics. I saw some high powered equations there. Um, did you, in your department, do the maths yourself, or was it contributed by maths department? Or Well, it would have been nice to get some feedback from math department. However, the, the equation that you saw was based, it was an equation for calculating production in. Uh, in natu the natural environment. It's, um, it's a, an, an equation that was developed by Heinz and Coleman in 1968, and since then has gone through a, a series of modifications. So it's now a standard used by biologists for calculating secondary production in the environment. So it's something that was existing beforehand. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that was when you came here. It's, it's, a it's a different thing now. All right. Any other questions? No? All right. Zara, thank you very much. We appreciate okay. that. Give her a round of applause. All right. Our next presenter is going to tell us, so you're going to go from pond fauna to cave fauna. But I guess you'd have some pond fauna in the cave as well, right? Yeah. So because we have some ponds in some caves. And so we, this presenter will be Gavin. And Gavin dabbles in caves. And he's going to tell us a little bit about it. So Gavin, over to you, sir. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Gavin Campbell. I'll be doing an assessment of the fauna, of the diversity of Jamaican cave fauna. So this is the outline of my presentation, going from background to preliminary results. What exactly is a cave? A cave a cave is a natural cavity in rock that is large enough to be entered by man. It can be classified based on rock type, morphology, as well as age. 
there are more than a thousand caves in Jamaica, many of which are made of limestone. And they can be classified into different zones, light, twilight, and dark zone. The fauna that have been collected in the 19th century, or the 20th century, sorry about that, 20th century in Jamaica, of the highest groups, we have, we have insects being the highest, followed closely by arachnids, and then followed subsequently by mammals and crustaceans, as well as, uh, as, well as other smaller groups throughout. The objectives of the project, of the research project, include to identify Jamaican fauna found in caves and classify them into significant groups, to assess the special adaptations of cave fauna, and to assess the physical chemical conditions of caves, of caves in Jamaica. So data collection. This collection has been occurring from June to October 2017 in the Helsha area. So five caves were visited first in the Helsha area, and two were selected based on their physical conditions as well as the presence of biota. These caves are the Cave Hill Estate Cave and the Hellshire Park Shopping Center Cave, so named due to their locations close to surrounding communities. So this is an overview of the map of Jamaica. Overview of the map of Jamaica here. This is my study site. And then I highlight the Hellshire Park community here and the cave one here, Hellshire Park Shopping Center Cave, and the Cave Hill Estate Cave here. Data collection measures for actual fauna include hand searching for 30 minutes per zone in each of the caves for three different collectors. Also, col uh, collection, measure, collection measures also included flight intercept traps, minnow traps, and pitfall traps. Four, what about bats, actually? When you think about a cave, you normally find, you normally hear someone talk about bats. So for, this, for the purpose of this study, vertebrates only were noted, not actually collected and assessed, except for fish and amphibians. The physical structure of the cave was also noted, as well as any ecological interactions. So interactions among and between organisms, and as well as interactions between organisms and the cave environment itself. So analysis and outcome. So species were identified to the level of family, and the species, uh, the Simpsons Diversity Index was used to calculate the diversity of each of the caves. So biologic biological data thus far. So for the Hellshire area, which is the cave, the cave Hill Estate area in Hellshire, I was able to find four different orders of different organisms within the caves. These include the Araneae, which are spiders, Blattodiae, cockroaches, decapods, and orthopterans. The number of families only totaled seven, and the diversity of this, of this cave environment was 0.73. It is relatively high, but not as high when you compare it to the following, 0.85, for the Hellshire Park Shopping Center, which had a total of 19, 19 different families, which included spiders, amblyplegids, as well as decapods and lepidopterans. Also, a fish was found within this particular cave. Important mentions, the whip scorpion. This is the amblypigid. It is a whip scorpion. It has antenniform legs and is found within the dark zone of different caves. This is an endemic, this an, this is an endemic species of shrimp Chaglocubanus jamaicensis, and is found in Jamaica only, and it hasn't been recorded several. It hasn't been recorded much since its discovery in the mid 1900s. As you can see, it's very small, and pigment and defigmented. That's one of the adaptations to the cave environment. And Eleotris bisonis. It is a relatively common fish in rivers and streams in Jamaica, but it's also been found in the caves, and it's been found in the substrate along. And this one, Chaglocubanus, was found in the stomach of this one. So it definitely has an implication on the population for different cave organisms. Physical chemical data. So when we're comparing the cave, we want to find out, the cave to the outside, we want to find out what conditions of the cave make organisms gravitate towards it. So what we have found is that there is lower light intensity in the different caves. So with cave Hill estate, the light intensity was about 100, which is about the light intensity of this room. That was inside the cave, and then inside Hillshire Park Shopping Center, it was 0 0.03, which is pretty much pitch black. Outside the cave, it was about 80 times greater, up to 2 million times greater in light intensity regarding Hillshire Park Shopping Center. With regard to temperature, you can see that temperature was higher. Temperature was higher. You can see that temperature was higher for both locations, outside the cave rather than inside the cave, by as much as four degrees in the Hillshire Park Shopping Center. Humidity as well was higher 
in inside the cave rather than outside the cave for both locations uh, by as much as 10 percent. What are the benefits of having lower temperatures, lower light intensity, and higher humidity? You're with these conditions, you have a lower risk of desiccation, lower visibility by predators, by predators, as well as flexibility in exoskeleton. So the organisms within the cave are better able to move around and maneuver through the environment to evade, to evade predators. When comparing these two caves, you see that there's a difference between diversity values. So you can see that the Simpsons index calculates 0.73 for the Cavell Estate Cave and 0.85 for the Hillshire Park Shopping Center Cave. This, this could be due to the difference in the location and the features of the individual caves. So the Cavell Estate Cave was actually more lit. It was more open and more terrestrial. So organisms that were more terrestrial and epigean could, inv could invade the Cavell Estate Cave. When compared to the Hillshire Park Shopping Center area, it only it had um, two different zones and it was not as exposed to light. And environmental stability, being more open, the organisms are able to being uh, sorry, being more op being more open, the environment is more closely in interconnected with the terrestrial environment, with the epigean environment. So any fluctuations in conditions in the epigean environment will also be translated to the more open light zone of the Cavell Estate Cave. The darker and more stable shopping center area was able to have greater species richness. So the amblypigids had six different families represented in the Hillshire Park versus one o versus two families for the Cavell Estate. And the amblypigid and grillacridids were found in the dark zone of the, of the Hillshire Park shopping center. Adaptations to this environment are longer limbs. As you can see for this amblypigid, it has its first legs elongated and stretched so that it's able to detect movements both in the physical environment as well as air currents. And the same for the gorilla critted, which has longer antennae here, greater than four times its body length. So it, that also helps to detect its physical environment since its eyes are not able to detect any visual stimulation. So for future work, I'll be studying green grotto caves in St. Anne as well as caves in Portland and Trelawney. And the importance of cave fauna or the importance of the research, actually. So this research will provide baseline data for the fauna that's found in Jamaica, as not much systematic work has been done regarding the fauna of Jamaican caves. Additionally, it's the first research of its kind to employ such multiple, such multiple methods for collecting different classes and different species of fauna. It also will have effects on tourism, especially ecotourism, and natural resource management. So guano, which has been found, which is one of the characteristics of caves, has been heavily mined due, could, due to its high nutrient content as a result of agriculture. And also water security and uh, forestry. Regarding water security, however, the organisms that are found within caves have an effect of removing detritus from the caves, help providing, helping to provide cleaner water for different resources, economic and as well as ecological resources. And forestry. As you can see from here, trees are heavily reliant on caves as well. So this is a tree that actually um, actually burrowed its roots through rock to find water within soil, and this was found within a dry limestone area. So where there is water scarcity, it can still help to provide forests and provide water for forests and trees around. These are some pictures of some caves that I visited recently. This was in the Portland Ridge. You can see how incredibly massive it is. These are some these are some stalactites actually forming, and this is rock with some with a pond right here. Any questions? Hey, thank you very much, Gavin. I can see I didn't even have to show my cards to him. <laughs> All right. So you see, he was asking for questions. So I was just looking, and I saw some hands go up. So I'm gonna start. Here, I'll be back with you if I have time. Just run this over for me. I did not under, understand why the exoskeleton in the cave, um, you said flexibility yes. over outside the yes. outside environment. Can you explain that again for me? Right, so with the outside environment, the temperatures would be higher and the light intensity would be greater. Therefore, they would need more sclerotization within their tissues more sclerotization within their tissues. So that would make their exoskeleton a bit harder and more rigid so they can reduce water loss. 
So when there is enough water available and there's lower temperatures and lower light intensity, they're able to maneuver their skeleton more easily. So they can run through the environment or hide in crevices and rocks that they wouldn't be able to if they were more sclerotized. Yes. Um, I heard that there are caves running like from um, St. Elizabeth to St. Andrew um, with, with some of these features. you know anything about that? Not about those specific caves, as I haven't been able to sample those. But I do know that there are caves that run, pardon? I do know that there are caves that run definitely up to three kilometers long underground. So there's a passage that you can walk through. You enter through the ground entrance and you can walk for four kilometers. It's about 50 minutes walking time. And within that cave, actually, you would need more walking time than that because there's going to be not a flat terrain. There will be different hills and different rocks that you need to climb up and holes you need to crawl through. All right. Another question around here. One of the things I know people didn't know uh, this Hellshire Shopping. Hellshire shopping, shopping Park Center. Okay. Hellshire Shopping Center. All right. Hellshire so Park it's shopping not center. it's not in the shopping center. So it's not right. <laughs> Actually, it was found right beneath the shopping center. So there was a shopping center here, and right over there, underground, there was the cave. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning. Many thanks for your presentation, but I really don't understand. Um, whenever time. The, there is a presentation on anything scientific. We get so little of the actual video presentation. One would have thought that having technology, you would be putting something more substantive for a conference like this. Many of us have never seen a cave. Many of us um, would just hear that we have caves. One would have thought that you would have gone in there with some sensible video cameras, video the caves, tell you the scientific data, and, 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 and um, provide us with, the, with all of the science that concern how a cave is constructed, the safety, those that are used for tourism purposes, etc. Similar similarly to when you're watching Science International, etc. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Think, you know, that, that's why it's way outside of the scope of the work that he's trying to do. And so uh, we, we hear it. But, um, and, and the other thing is that um, if you would want to help, we could set up another team to do that if you help to buy some infrared cameras because you heard the light intensity which he spoke about inside the cave. So you need some special equipment, sir, and some money would help. So if you can find that, we can get that for you. Additionally, additionally though, additionally regarding my my question is about health and safety. Um, I didn't notice that you mentioned anything about it, but from my experience with caving, because some years ago, you know, um, I went with an uh, expedition of the Natural History Society of Jamaica, and unfortunately, some of our members came down with some serious illnesses due to the bats. Uh, I think one person died. It was many years ago. And this was in St. Anne, where I resided for many years. Um, so I, I'm just curious, you know, um, do you pay any attention to that because you, you are at risk? The second thing is, um, I noticed your comment about the, the ex highly uh, extended caves, because during the Taino period here, that's what they used um, very slyly. So when the Spanish saw that they decimated them, not all of them did, and then they blended with the African people. Um, what I'm looking at, though, is that they are of very high value for survival in these times, especially if you have earthquakes or tsunamis. So have you thought about applying your research to um, cataloging these caves and maybe uh, commenting on you know, uh, the ones that could be used to sequester people in the event of any serious? With regard to the second question, these actual exactly. surveying of the caves would be something that's more ba more geological, so it wouldn't be necessarily what I'd be doing. And regarding the health of the caves, when we do actually visit, we do assess the conditions of the cave. The, the only thing that we do not actually measure is the level of carbon dioxide that we find when we enter the caves, which could cause suffocation. But if we... But... Can you hear me now? Yeah, but if we do encounter any particular conditions within the cave. So if we notice that we're getting out of breath a bit too quickly, then we start to back out of that area. So we don't endanger ourselves because safety is going to be the priority when we're sampling different caves throughout Jamaica. All right. All right. Oh, yes, regarding the video. 
regarding the video, I do have a website, Ecology SE, and you can find videos, links to videos there as well. And you can follow GRC Ecology on, e on Instagram to find more natural history society, natural history um, projects as well. All right. Thank you very Thank much, you. Gavin. Give him a big round of applause. Yeah. All right. So we're going to move on. And now we're going to have Tristan Bowman, who is going to talk to us about Fishing Salt River. And remember to glance at me occasionally, okay? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tremaine Bowman, and I am a first year MPhil student working with Dr. Eric Hislop. And my topic is we are assessing the composition, mapping distribution, and examining resource partitioning in the fish community of Salt River, a saline lotic system in Jamaica. So what is a river? Scientifically, the term is a lotic system. And you heard my colleague Zara talking about lentic systems, which are ponds which tend to be stagnant bodies of water. Lotic systems refer to shallow, long, narrow channels of fast-flowing water, and often the water tends to be fresh water. Salt River, however, yes, it does have fast-flowing water. Yes, it's shallow, long, and narrow. But the water is not exactly fresh. Rather, it is a brackish water river. And the type of fish fauna that exists in the ecosystem, there are few freshwater species, but rather, predominantly, these species tend to be marine. So the background of this study is that the freshwater fauna of Jamaica is depauperate, meaning that it's lacking. Because if you understand the geology of Jamaica, you would see that it basically, they had a, there was a period of submergence and reemergence, And as such, the fauna is not Jamaica isn't as like Finns and Trinidad that tend that was broken off from a mainland continent and they would have like a higher diversity of fauna. Rather, Jamaica, it's a true island within itself. And as such, um, it kind of, it's limited to the migration of freshwater fish species, right? And well, of course, as I mentioned, freshwater and marine fish occupy Salt River. And considering the fact that when once you have many animals occupying any kind of habitat, there must be some level of competition. So, what, so we will be examining that as well. And well, of course, research is efficient because anywhere you go in the Caribbean, anywhere, <laughs> there's always research that needs to be done. And there hasn't been research on the fish fauna of Salt River as well. So these are my objectives. So my first objective is to assess the composition of the fish fauna. I will do this by identifying the fish down to species, as well as enumerating the numbers. So seeing what numbers of, let's say, majaras as compared to snappers. And I will map the ecology and examine the taxonomic characteristics of the fish at Salt River. This will be done by length weight relationships, comparing the condition factor, meaning as in the condition factor just gives kind of like a general um, it basically tells you the com condition of the fish in terms of feeding patterns, etc. And the morphometrics, meaning, all right, the dorsal fin, number of spines, number of rays, and comparing them to each other, the distribution, how they're distributed along the channel, microhabitat requirements. And then my third objective is to determine the extent of competition among species at Salt River. This will be done by stomach content analysis. Basically, when we dissect these stomachs and we see what they're feeding on. So let's say one type of fish might pre feed predominantly on ostracods as compared to another type of fish might feed on insects or other types of insects. So that's what we'll be looking at. Dial feeding cycles. Basically, if it feeds, let's say some types of fish feed mainly in the morning as compared to midday as compared to the evening, right? And we'll explore other resource partitioning mechanisms. So this is my site, Salt River Mineral Bar. This is the general area. It's, in, it's located in southern Clarendon. And my first site 
is by the Salt River Mineral Bath. However, this site is a bit difficult to sample because this is where a lot of people come, like a lot of families come on a Saturday and for recreation. So we have a lot of people coming around. Where you do? Make me see now. And that, you know, that, that kind of scares off the fish. And then, so sometimes we do three nets and there's literally no fish in it. So that's a bit difficult to sample at times. Seacam now is, uh, this is, I don't know if, well, us biologists, we'll know where Seacam is. And we go there for a lot of our um, third year field trips. And it's a fairly easier site to sample. It's right um, off the road. And we just go down there and it's flat and it's fairly shallow. It's just a little muddy. So, you know, we tend to get stuck in there, but it's okay. We, we, we'll always come out. <laughs> and we recently found a site in February. And um, this is our, the roadside. And it's a little more difficult to sample, but we still got a considerable catch, nevertheless. And then we sample the estuary. That's my favorite place to sample. Very easy, very quick. The substrate is firm. No one gets stuck. And well, we go out into the sea, and we get our catch there as well, so that we could compare the catch from the river to the sea. And these are just some pictures of my sites. Um, these two are higher up from Mineral Spring. This is Seacam. You see the estuary here, and this is the sea on this side, and the estuary goes into the sea this way. All right, so, so far for my methodology, we try to collect data every month. However, there are times when things happen, so we are planning to probably start collecting every three, every three weeks rather than every month instead of, okay, we go in this month, and then something happens. Because not like the fish saying, oh, Tremaine's coming, so we just go run and hide. So anytime we go, we should be able to get a considerable catch. Um, we use a same net at all the sites, and a total of three nets are done at each site, and the fish samples are placed in labeled bags. The other organisms are returned to the water, and well, physical chemical data is, is um, gathered using our dissolved oxygen meter and our multi-parameter meter. And here we'll see us seining myself and Dr. Hislop, and we have a crab escaping back into the water, and these are some of the fish that I will collect. So far for the results, we see that the conductivity usually ranges from about 500 parts per million all up to nearing 1,000 parts per million, roughly 900 and something. However, in Jamaica, the freshwater and most other rivers, the conductivity usually ranges around 400 parts per million parts per million, I said meter, oh sorry, <laughs> parts per million, right? And we see that in Salt River, especially in the estuary and especially up by the mineral spring, it goes up to even to more than double that. The pH tends to be roughly 6.9 to 7.7. .7. And the temperature, oh, I want to show you that in, at CCAM you would see that the conductivity tends to be lower than at the other sites. And when you compare it, you see that the temperature sometimes tends to be lower than the other sites. As I said, we only sample this site once. And this would make sense because considering that fresh water tends to, usually the, um, the temperature tends to be cooler. So these, we see the co correlation between the conductivity and the temperature here. And then the dissolved oxygen. There was a difference in dissolved oxygen from December to January, but as I mentioned, this is very preliminary data that I've collected, so we haven't figured out our reasons for that yet. And these, so far I have 12 species. Some of them I couldn't identify all the way down to family. But mainly we have majaras, snappers, needlefish, barracudas, anchovy, pufferfish, jacks. And the mojaras tend to dominate the catch, but there's a considerable difference in the numbers, as you can see already. Thus far, we see that most of the fish, when we check their standard lengths against, uh, this is the, the literature revealed that these are the maximum and common standard lengths. And we see that for the gyrus scenarius and the diapterus, which is the Irish mojara, and the yellowfin mojara, they haven't crossed basically 28% of the common length or the max length. 
and they used to not smell sargentas. There was one fairly large fish because it was roughly around 44% of the common length. So all gerrits captured already are juveniles, right? And we realize that this area tends to be a mangrove nursery for juvenile fish. And this in turn would affect the fish stock. Now people would wonder, how could it affect the fish stock? Nobody really eats majaras, right? But the reality is that everything adheres to a hierarchy and a food chain. So while we may not eat majaras, we have seen that we have snappers. And snappers are predators, so they would eat some of, the, some of these types of fish. The physical chemical data also reveal that the conductivity is much higher than normal freshwater, which I mentioned. And the estuarine values tend to be similar to that of the adjacent sea. The composition of the sea catch and the catch in the river is different. So are we assume so far that some fish from the sea don't tend to swim into the river? Because what happens is a lot of fish, the, the adults tend to swim upstream and they will probably lay their eggs and because that's all there's less wave action so it's safer for the smaller and the smaller fishy juveniles and the juveniles will kind of swim downstream back to the sea and the community is dominated by gerids which are majaras because the majaras have a protrusible mouth which i would show you in a little while and uh, let me show you it right now so Right, so you see here that the Majaras have a very protrusible mouth, right? And the substrate at Salt River tends to be like muddy, so, muddy substrate, right? And because of this mouth that has been adapted, it tends to be able to feed and tends to be able to go, into, go deeper into the substrate to get the insects, the benthic macroinvertebrates, etc. And however, so a step further, there are a few things that we may change. So. Because this method tends to favor catching smaller fish, we may try to use fish traps as a possible solution to see if there's a variation in the size of the catch. And the fish migration and feeding patterns may be affected diurnally. And as such, we will probably try to, um, try to see if we, could, if we catch in the morning what that will reveal as compared to midday as compared to in the evening. And then we may head further into the mangrove by boat and try to catch try to catch other types of fish further into the mangrove. And that's it for me. And I'm just going to show you some pictures of my fish. So here you see there's a snapper. These are jacks. This one here is a croaker. And I think this one is a croaker as well. This is an unknown fish. It has a little flap on the head. But we haven't been able to identify it just yet. So we're gonna, we have to keep looking for keys to see what this fish is. And these are two types of majaras, and they probably look, they look, the, they look the same, but there are differences between them. And the anchovies, croakers, and gobies. All right, and snappers and croakers. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Th these are some very, time disciplined people so we have time for questions uh, and we really appreciate it and i'm speaking on behalf of the organizers <laughs> all right any questions no all right seems like nobody wants to question you about anything fishy <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much Jermaine. we all appreciate right. it all right. thank you all right and so now, you, I assume Salt River was a low altitude river, right? Oh, so now we're going to move to a high altitude or high altitude rivers. And Sashoni is going to tell us about macroinvertebrates in high altitude rivers in Jamaica. Good afternoon. My name is Sashoni Goodwin, and my study is titled The Study of High Altitude Rivers in Central Jamaica, a comparison of the undisturbed and disturbed sections of three rivers in Upper Manchester and Lower Trelawney. 
So most studies done here so far on rivers in Jamaica have been carried out at low altitudes. So not much is known about high altitude Jamaican streams. At higher altitudes, water temperatures tend to be lower and low temperature aquatic environments have the capacity to hold larger volumes of dissolved oxygen, which is important for the biotic functions of aquatic life forms. And here I have the term undisturbed rivers as a question. And this is because in the tropics, usually we don't have rivers that are completely undisturbed. Because regardless of how isolated a river is, or how difficult it is for us to access it, we usually find ways of means of getting to it in order to utilize it. The activities of humans can alter the physiochemical properties of rivers. And this in turn will affect the macroinvertebrate community. And macroinvertebrates are essentially insects that live in water. They are sessile and they live near or among the sediments, basically. And they're very sensitive, which means that they respond readily to changes in the aquatic environment. And this makes them very good indicators of water quality. So they can use for water quality assessment. So with this in mind, the objectives of my research are to compare the macroinvertebrate communities of the undisturbed and disturbed sections of three rivers to determine how the activities of humans can alter the physiochemical properties of the river and how this will affect the macroinvertebrate community. And finally, I'll compare my findings to a low-lying, typical low-lying Jamaican river. The project area lies south of the cockpit country, which is a watershed area that constitutes about approximately 40% of Jamaica's freshwater resources. And the three rivers that I sampled were a section of the Cave River, which is in Upper Manchester, and Quashes River and Rock Spring, which is found in Lower Trelawney, which are found in Lower Trelawney, sorry. And here we have just depicting the towns nearest to my sample site. So we have Spring Garden, Troy Turn, and Silent Hill. Well, I should rather say these are small communities, not town. And the, the rivers that our nearest to those are the Rock Spring, Quashes River, and the Cave River, respectively. So those are the rivers that I sampled. And Cave River is, is a predominantly limestone river. And it, cons it consists of a series of waterfalls in the upper courses, which is difficult to access. And in the, lo the lower section lies outside, a water outside of Christina, near a water supply station. Quashes River is a sedimentary river. It is not as isolated as, a, as Cave River, and it is used a lot by locals for domestic washing. Every time I went for sampling, there was always somebody there washing, every single time. And finally, we have the Rock Spring, which is a tributary with a limestone substrate as well. That's near a coca farm, and it's used mostly for irrigation, but some domestic washing occurred there as well sometimes because mostly persons wash in Moat River that Rock Spring flows into. However, while I was sampling, there was this drought period where the rivers were drying up. So persons started actually migrating upwards into the tributary to do their domestic washing. The data for my study was collected over a period of 14 months, and I visited Rock Spring and and Quashes River in one month and Cave River in the alternating month. Each month at each site, I collected 10 samples in the undisturbed sections and 10 in the disturbed section using the kick net. And I also measured the physiochemical parameters. The benthic macroinvertebrates that could be identified easily in the field were identified and recorded and released well below the point of sampling. And the rest were brought back to the lab for identification down to the family level with the aid of the dissecting microscope. And then I analyzed the data. So some of the things that I did were a few similarity indices. And I used the, the Jacquard's community coefficient index and the Whitaker's percentage similarity index. Another thing that I looked at was the ET index. And this is basically a measure of the proportion of the population that comprised of ephemeropterans and tricopterans. And this formula can be 
was, it was actually applied to other groups also to figure out what proportions they were in the population. But we'll get to that later on. So we're at my results. And the first thing I want to show you is a nice color-coded table here showing the functional feeding categories of the benthic macroinvertebrates that were found in the three rivers. And we have grazers which feed on biofilm, that's fungus and bacteria that may grow on leaves that are on, on the rocks. And the shredders actually shred the actual leaves and feed on the leaves. Predators prey on other animals and the collectors feed are, co are filter feeders and they feed on detritus or particles that were dislodged by the grazers or shredded by the shredders. And on my graph, I have a section that here that says collector and predators. And this is because the chironomid, this family contained two species, one of which was a collector and the other a predator. And here we have some examples of some of the families that I found. So the mayfly is an example of an aphemeropteran, and the caddisfly is a tricopteran. And we have the hydrobid snails and water strider and the whirligig beetle, as we call them here in Jamaica. So the first thing I want to look at is the comparison for the between the undisturbed and disturbed sections of each river. And here we have two graphs showing the average conductivity and average pH. And the thing that I, what, what the t-test uh, carried out indicated that there was indeed a significant difference between the undisturbed and disturbed sections of Quash's River and between cave, the undisturbed and disturbed section of Cave River in terms of conductivity. However, there was no, no significant difference between pH in pH between the undisturbed and disturbed section of any of the river. Also, there is a correlation, th there is no correlation, sorry, between the conductivity or pH and family richness and abundance in the undisturbed and disturbed section of the river. The next thing I, I looked at was the family richness relative to rainfall. Because for the most part, there was really no, I found that the physical chemical properties weren't really influencing the macroinvertebrate composition found or the, the richness. So I looked at, I asked, I called MedService, emailed MedService and got the rainfall data for comparison. And I found that for the undisturbed and uh, undisturbed sections of Quash's River and Rock Spring, when the rainfall decreased, it actually had an increase in the macroinvertebrate abundance and also the richness, the family richness that were found. So this is another thing I want us to take a close look at, which is the of certain groups as a proportion of the total number. And the groups that I'm looking at is the euphemeropterans and trichopterans as one, the hydrobid snails and the thyroid snails. Now historically in Jamaica, we mostly had the hydrobid snails and the thyroids are, were introduced to Jamaica. We had two species, which are the Melanoides tuberculata, which are not as widespread as the Thyra granifera, which is the other species of introduced snails. The Thyra granifera was introduced in the 90s, and since then they've become a real problem at low, at low altitude. When you sample low-lying rivers, you find thyroids everywhere, basically. And usually where you find a lot of thyroids, you find either very little or no hydrobin snails. And this is somewhat reflected here because in the undisturbed sections of the rivers, you find fewer proportions of the thyroids, which is the green bars, and greater proportions of the thyroids in the disturbed sections. And usually, well, at least in the case for Quash's River and Cave River, when the amount of thyroids increased, the proportions of the hydrobid snails decreased. And I should also say that they're in direct comp competition because both are grazers, so they feed on the same thing. And because the thyroid is more tolerant and they can be found adult, adult, just under about any conditions, they usually, they can somewhat outcompete the hydrobid snails. So when it comes to the analysis among the rivers now, I compared the rivers using the similarity indices that I had here. And these were, the two that I used were the Jacquard's Community Coefficient Index and the Whitaker's Percentage Similarity Index. And one of the things that you notice is that you get different values based on the 
method used. The jacquards take into account the presence and absence of certain sets within a data group. And in this case, the sets for me is for families. So according to, the, and sorry, I should say that the verticals does the same thing, but this takes into account the numbers of individuals within each family as well. So for the JCC, you find that it says that Quashes River and Cave River are the most similar. But when you look at Whitakers, it says that Quashes River and Cave River are the least similar. And the most similar rivers, more similar rivers are Cave River and Rock Spring. So you just get different values based on the index used. And the final and the last thing I want to do is a comparison with a typical low-lying river. For this one, I chose Buff Bay River. Now look at the sample rivers which are on the left, yeah, your left. Um, you see that for the collectors and predators, which are represented by the blue and red graphs respectively, you find mostly equal values in terms of the functional feeding properties, right? Very equal and very similar here. However, when you look at the Buff Bay River, this pale gray graph represents the collectors and this darker gray is for the predators. And you find that the collectors outnumber the predators every single time. You also find that here we had few shredders and also there are few shredders that were found in the low line river, although albeit a bit more in the in Buff Bay River than the Sampun rivers. And, fine, and so in conclusion, some of the things that I could come at, some of the conclusions that I arrived at based on my research on a whole was that the activities of humans affect the physiochemical properties of rivers. However, rivers with high buffering capacity can counteract these changes. And the main fact, look, sorry, the main factor that seemed to affect r the macroinvertebrate com community overall was rainfall. And there's not much difference between the undisturbed and disturbed sections in terms of richness and abundance. However, the proportions of each family that made up the population were different. And the proportions of the fe functional feeding groups found in the high altitude streams were differ different from those in the low altitude stream, which, like I said, I compared it to Buff Bay River. And also the composition of the macroinvertebrate community is different. And the variations in thyroids and hydrobids appears to be inversely related. And that has brought us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Sashoni. I, I hope nobody noticed how difficult it was for me to even get Sashoni to glance my way. <laughs> However, I know why she didn't do that, because she was well within her time. Okay. Are there any questions? Indeed. All right, so I have two. This time, I come to you after. Well, water is my business, and y your, your study, I wonder if, did the Water Commission in any way participate in your study? Because years ago, I was interested in that when I directed the water labs in Montego Bay, and I visited some of the locations that you put up there. Um, but it, I was trying to get them to do some studies like that because where you have high oxygen tension, of course, the quality is better. You know, uh, it, it's, um, it doesn't permit um, anaerobiosis. So there are possibilities, you know, for it as a source of water supply. And um, since many people downstream may be polluting, you know, you're always looking up the top. So your type of information here, do you share it with the Water Commission? Well, I happen to know, and interestingly enough, one of the things that I really, really wanted to look at in detail was the dissolved oxygen. But our DO meter died within the midst of my research, so I really didn't get to col collect that much in conclusive data. But no, no, I haven't shared it with the Water Commission, really. I mean, it's yeah, you probably don't know. I mean, the person at the water supply station saw me, and all they did was ask me if I was catching fish. I explained that I wasn't, but that's about it. All right. Um, thanks for your presentation. I do not have a fundamental question, but only because I'm from that, from, from that area. I'm from Christiana, and above Christian and, and, and around. And 
the, the areas on the, on the map, uh, I'm quite familiar with them. So that's a fundamental reason. Who are your collaborators on the ground for um, give, providing you rainfall data and other um, local information? All right. Local information was provided to me because the rivers, I already was familiar with the cave river, but back then I really didn't know what it was called because my family is actually from that area as well. Yes, which is how I came up with the research. I actually visited the rivers there once while I was actually thinking about, I was just visiting family and we went to this river right here actually. And then I realized, you know, that I actually don't know the official name of this river and probably Nobody there does either, so that's how I actually started, you know, this would be an interesting area to look at for the research. And they, so, yeah, I had my relatives cart me around looking for different rivers I could look at, and then I brought Dr. Hislop, and yes, we decided on what to choose. For the rainfall data, I got that from the Meteorological Service of Jamaica. I just emailed them for the rainfall data in order to compare it, because as I said, I realized that I wasn't really seeing much um, correlation between my, the physical chemical data and how it was really influencing the, the, um, the macroinvertebrates. So I checked the rainfall and realized that rainfall played a keen role in this. So yeah, that's one of the things I did. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Shodi. The hometown girl doing science in the river. I hope you took Dr. Hislop to get some good food on that area, right? Did she? Uh, you owe him one. <laughs> okay. All right. So we move on now to the final presentation in the session. And we're going to have Damian Neat, who is going to talk to us about, uh, give us a glimpse into the armyworm population and its diversity. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so I'll be presenting preliminary, preliminary, <laughs> preliminary data on um, the genetic diversity of three armyworms in Jamaica. Now, the Lepidopteran family Noctuidae consists of nocturnal gray and black moths, and specifically the Spadoptera genus, known as the armyworms. They contain numerous species that have obtained spec status. Now, three such armyworms are the Spadoptera fugiperda, known as the fall armyworm. We have the Spadoptera latisfacia, known as the velvet armyworm. And we have the Spadoptera exigua, known as the beet armyworm. The larval stage of these three armyworms have obtained spec status and are currently found in Jamaica and are documented to affect numerous crops. Now, the typical armyworm life cycle consists of about 38 to 90 days, in which two to eight days are for the eggs. The eggs are laid on the undersides of leaves, and they are laid in batches of around 50 to 200 and are covered with scales. After the eggs hatch, the larvae emerge, and they last around 10 to 30 days. The larvae will span various instars, and then they will pupate. The pupation period lasts around 5 to 20 days, and in the case of the bee tamworm, the pupa occurs in the soil. After pupation, the adult will um, emerge, and this lasts around 9 to 22 days, and during this stage, the adults will feed, mate, and lay more eggs. Now, the larval stage of the armyworms are usually confused. However, they can be identified by examining various morphological um, features. So for the fall armyworm, there are four black spots on the abdominal section. For the beet, uh, for the velvet armyworm, they consist of triangular dorsal markings, and these dorsal markings are composed of dots. And for the beet armyworm, they consist of a distinctive lateral um, spot on the mesothorax. Now, what is the economical importance of these um, pests? So we know that pests and disease are the most challenging aspect of the agricultural industry. Armyworms are important to the Jamaican agricultural scene due to the, uh, the amount of the level of loss and damage they bring to farmers. Now, in 2012, the Sugar Institute reported that uh, 
6.15 hectares of land was damaged or lost due to um, fall armyworm in 2009. The beet armyworm outbreak that lasted between 2009 and 2012 resulted in Jamaican $140 million in loss and damage to onions and scallion, and this was primarily in St. Elizabeth, Elizabeth. A more recent outbreak last year reported over Jamaican $100 million in loss, loss due to the beet armyworm that affects more crops. It's not only in St. Elizabeth, and it is affecting different um, areas. So what is done to manage these pests? Now, the two main ways, ways in which these pests are managed is through pesticides and biological control. In Jamaica, the common um, way in which we try to manage these pests is through pesticide use. However, biological control is another way we can um, approach the management since there are numerous pathogens, um, parasitoids, and predators that affect the larval and the egg stage of these army worms. Um, there's a problem with pesticide use since uh, the Army, uh, the beet and the velvet armyworm have both uh, re reported uh, resistance to the major classes of insecticides. So why do we need to study the genetic diversity of pests? Well, advances in molecular biology and the identification of various molecular markers make it easy to study the genetic diversity of pests. Data provided on genetic diversity can give us a better understanding of the host preferences, the behavior, the physiology and the pesticide susceptibility. Looking at host preferences, we know that the uh, fall armyworm exists in two morphologically indistinguishable strains, the corn and the rice strain. The corn strain feeds primarily on corn, while the rice strain feeds primarily on rice and any other grasses. Not much is known on the genetic diversity of armyworms in Jamaica. So in this study, we use a partial CY gene to assess the genetic diversity of the beet, velvet, and fall armyworms. So the main aim was to assess the genetic diversity and the phylogenetic relationship of three spodoptera species in Jamaica by analyzing parcel CY gene segments. Specific objectives included one, to use specific primers to amplify partial CY gene segment by PCR, two, to generate bioinformatic data and determine the genetic diversity of the three armyworms in Jamaica by calculating the number of haplotypes, the nucleotide diversity, and the haplotype diversity, and three, to perform phylogenetic analysis of three armyworms in Jamaica using CY partial gene segments. <coughs> so how did we carry out our study? We first did sampling in various um, areas in Jamaica. Then we collected larvae, bring them back to the lab where we extracted the DNA. From the DNA, we amplified a partial segment of the CY gene by using PCR, after which those PCR fragments were sent for sequencing. And once we got the sequence, we did our data analysis and used various um, computer programs to generate bioinformatic data. So how was the diversity measured in this study? Well, we looked at the conserved and variable region of the DNA. We looked at the nucleotide diversity. We looked at the haplotype number. We looked at the haplotype diversity, which is also called the genetic diversity. We did a comparative analysis of the three armyworms. And we looked at the evolutionary divergence of the beet armyworm to get an idea of the source of infestation in Jamaica. So samples were collected from St. Elizabeth, Clarendon, and St. Thomas. The partial CY gene was successfully amplified for all three armyworms that were studied, and a total of 43 armyworm samples were sequenced. Let's take a look at the beet armyworm. What we found was that there were three variable regions on the segment that we amplified. It resulted in three haplotype being found. We expect or there's a possibility of more haplotypes um, existing in the population. If we increase the number of samples, we're expecting to find more since studies have found over 43 haplotypes of the beet army worm. When we looked at the nucleotide and the genetic diversity, we were reporting a moderate level of genetic diversity of the beet army worm. And this was in comparison with two different studies done in China, and our value for the genetic diversity was considered moderate. 
In terms of the phylogenetic analysis, the three haplotypes of the beet armyworm that were identified, they all formed three clades on phylogenetic trees. However, the branching for haplotype 1 was not highly supported with bootstrap values. The bootstrap value was 62%. However, when we looked at the genetic distance between the different haplotypes, we found that haplotype 1 and haplotype 2, they were closely related, 0.1%. So this is indicating that these two haplotypes share a very recent ancestor. In terms of the evolution and divergence of the beet army worm, we found that haplotype 1 and haplotype 2, they were closely related to haplotypes from UK, and Georgia, we found that haplotype 2, haplotype 3, sorry, was very, very 100% um, similar to haplotype in Spain. Now, this is giving us a sense of the source of infestation in Jamaica. Looking at this three week tree, we can see that haplotype 1 and 2, the closely related um, relatives are from Florida, USA, Georgia, and the UK. Then we look at haplotype 3, and then we're seeing Spain as the close, closest res relative. Now, we're not expecting that haplotype 3 is going to fly all the way from Spain to Jamaica. But if you look at our closest ge geographic um, na um, neighbor, Florida there, and Georgia right there, it is telling us that these armyworms might have gotten into the country through um, either one, the exchange of produce, and in recent years, international travel. If we take a look at the fallen velvet armyworm, we found, sorry, we found both strains of the fall armyworm in Jamaica. It is the velvet, that is the corn and the rice strains. However, we weren't reporting a high level of genetic diversity for the fall armyworm. The velvet armyworm, armyworm, on the other hand, we were reporting a very high genetic diversity in the velvet armyworm. Uh, so, in terms of the genetic distance of the rice and corn strains found in Jamaica, the rice strains, they differed, and the corn strain differed by 1.6%. When we look at the, the phylogenetic tree for the velvet armyworm, most of the branches, branches were not resolved. So we had to look at the genetic distance, and we were seeing that majority of the haplotypes are very closely related. In terms of the comparative analysis, the beet armyworm was the most distance when compared to the other armyworms. Uh, the fall and the velvet armyworm, they were closely related, 4.3%, and they share a most recent ancestor. As you can see, the beet armyworm was least closest related, ranging from 6.6% to 7.6%. So what does this mean for pest management? We take a look at the identification. We found various haplotypes of the armyworms, and we found both corn and rice strains of the fall armyworm when we did our molecular um, analysis. In pest management, we're trying to move towards a target-specific approach, and if we can target our manager pests down to the haplotype level or even to the strain level, that would be very beneficial. Information on the genetic diversity give us an idea of the pesticide resistance in a population. Now, populations with low diversity, these populations are less likely to respond to environmental pressure. In the pest management ecosystem, environmental pressure is usually a management strategy that is used, and in, this, in Jamaica's case, we use a lot of pesticides. So, a population with low diversity once we uh, apply a pesticide, we're expecting that that pesticide should work. In the case of the beet armyworm, that is what we're expecting. Populations with high diversity, they are more likely to respond to environmental pressure. This is to say that uh, both alleles for resistance and susceptibility are in the population. So when we use a pesticide, we might knock out the alleles that are for susceptibility, but we leave the resistant alleles within the population. Genetic studies give us an idea of migration. Our study, we found that all the haplotypes that were identified, they were not segregated to a specific area in Jamaica. They were found all over. So this is speaking to the level of gene flow in the population. Um, 
these mods, they are active pliers. Um, the gene, the mar molecular marker that we use, the CY gene, is one of the microchondrial DNA, and that is inherited from the mother. So it is giving us an, ID, uh, an indication of how well a female flies and established within a specific area. Molecular studies are also very important in studying the monitoring invasive species. We know that the beta amyrum, beta amyrum is not, um, not from this hemisphere and it was originated in the Southeast Asia. And our study found one, one appetite similar to appetites in Spain. So this is telling us that the beta amyrum is a well established invasive species in Jamaica. And lastly, genetic data is very useful in IPM strategies. Many IPM strategies today are constructed using biology and ecological data, and we have pro pro produced some form of genetic um, data that can help um, plan these um, strategies effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damian. All right, I see already a question here for you. I mean, I need to ask something because I'm I'm been sitting here and I can't ask questions for own students, so I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> so, so, can you just um, expand on why um, knowing what species or haplotype you have is important for the point of view of management, from from what point of view of pest management? So. Uh in Jamaica, currently, we use a lot of pesticides to manage pests, and the idea is that it will work for all insects, but that is not usually the case. So we need to know what we're managing so we can use it the most effective method. Right. Right. It, okay. Damien, a question from a non-scientist. Um, I want to understand, you said that there were two methods used to control the worms. And one was the pesticide, which after a time becomes resistant. Then the other method. Um, how was, how um, responsive were the farmers and so to? Did you actually speak to farmers, first of all? Yes, spoke to farmers. And how how um, responsive they were to using the other method? All right, so there are other methods. There are not just two methods, but um, the two that are usually focused on are the chemical and biological control. We have other methods of controlling or man managing pests. But in terms of biological control, farmers are not receptive to that method because it does not um, give them the desired effect as quick as possible. Uh, so a pesticide, they spray a pesticide, they get the effect immediately. But when it comes on to biological control, it has to deal with the ecosystem, and it takes, it takes a while for the effects to be shown. So they want something that is the effects are shown immediately. All right. Any other questions? All right, Damon, there seem to be no other questions, so thank you very much. All right. As you can see, guys, we have done very well in terms of time had five good presentations. It's one of the things when you talk about biodiversity, people don't understand how important it is that Jamaica protects its biodiversity and that we understand what happens in terms of the ecosystem. We cannot go forward talking about prosperity and growth if we're not protecting the environment and protecting the ecosystem and maintaining Jamaica's biodiversity, what we're going to build a sound economy on. And so, Thank you guys for the work you're doing. And I want to thank you all for coming, sharing in this session. And I look forward to seeing you in future sessions. Thank you very much.